I begin. I, I just want to again encourage uh, anyone to ask questions if uh, if you're confused or if you have you know even just tangential questions. Um, I noticed there weren't many questions uh, yesterday or, or in general. Um, so as a form of bribery, I'm offering uh, a gift of a free hat, <laughs> free Lazouche hat, uh, for the most interesting uh, question. <laughs> and uh, and the criteria for most interesting is to, to be determined later. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, so a free hat's waiting for you, maybe. Okay, so I just want to uh, begin by briefly reviewing some of the main ideas um, from, from yesterday. So um, I, I explained that you know, uh, a lot of people are interested in building quantum interfaces between uh, light and atoms, or atomic ensembles. And uh, one of the key ideas is that our standard quantum equations, or Maxwell-Bloch equations, to describe these interfaces um, you know, the, so a realistic theory necessarily has to simplify something. And it happens to be that our textbook equations uh, make the simplification that wave interference and multiple scattering don't matter. Um, so that manifests itself in, in two ways. So uh, first, in the Maxwell-Bloch equations, you basically smooth out the atomic density. So you don't worry about exactly where the atoms are, whether the positions even matter. Um, and, and second, uh, you assume that if you have excited atoms, uh, these atoms emit independently into, into free space, into 4 pi. Um, but if, if uh, emission of light is a wave phenomenon, if there's interference, you know, fundamentally that can't be true. Um, the true uh, emission has to involve correlations, you know, spatial correlations, non-local correlations between atoms. Um, and so that's kind of you know, uh, you know, true kind of abstractly, but then you might also ask, you know, can interference be a new resource or untapped resource for applications? And then if you have a theory that includes interference really at the quantum level, can you uncover new quantum phenomena? Um, so uh, then I introduce uh, one possible you know, theoretical uh, framework, a so-called quantum spin model, um, where in principle such effects are included. Um, so basically, uh, the spin model encodes atom-atom uh, -atom interactions, um, where the type of atom-atom interaction is such that you know, if one atom is excited and another one is in the ground state, they can just flip each other. That's uh, due to the process of photon emission and, and reabsorption. And then the strength of that interaction between atoms I and J is just given by the electromagnetic Green's function, or how a photon propagates from one point to another. Um, the nice thing about the spin model is that um, all the real degrees of freedom are just encoded in the atoms. So if, if you can imagine that I can solve, uh, for example, the dynamics of the wave function or density matrix under this Hamiltonian, if I can construct all the atomic correlation functions, then I can construct all the correlation functions of uh, the total field for free. And that's because I can formally rewrite the total field as a coherent sum of the input field, uh, whose properties I presumably know, and the correlation functions of the atoms themselves. Um, so then uh, I, I just proceeded to, to you know, try and use this spin model for one uh, simple example. So I took a 1D chain of atoms in, in free space, in, in 3D, and I considered the limit of a single excitation. Um, so what we found then is you know, if you have an in, in the limit of an infinite array, then these single excitations will be diagonalized by block states. So you can uh, you know, calculate a, a dis, uh, band structure for these uh, block modes. And interestingly, if the lattice constant of this array is below lambda over 2, then uh, you necessarily have this, the appearance of, uh, uh, of some of these block modes, which have a k-vector bigger than that of free space, bigger than uh, omega over c. So what that means is that these uh, collective spin wave excitations can't couple to radiation fields. And therefore, they'll have exactly zero decay rate in the infinite system limit. So an atom is excited, but you'll never lose it uh, in the form of emitted photon. Um, and then finally, for, uh, if you kind of go to a finite case, you see that a lot of the kind of same physics still persists. So if I just take you know, 30 atoms and I calculate the most subradiant eigenstate um, under this Hamiltonian, and then I go and plot the fields, you see that basically in the bulk, you see no uh, radiated light. So basically, along the bulk, the light is being waveguided by this array. Um, and then when you hit the end, you get a little bit of end fire emission. That's exactly what you would see if you just take a normal optical fiber and you cut, uh, uh, cut one end. OK, so um, I also, I think uh, last time I concluded by saying that um, you know, once I have, a, if I can create a, a subwavelength array, 
I'll naturally create these subradiant states or have their existence, but it's going to be hard to couple to them or, or see them in general. And the intuition is basically the following. When I say that I see some optical property of an atom, what it means is I usually shine in a laser and see, you know, try to look for some effect. But you know, by definition, a laser is a radiation field, so no matter which direction I send it in from, um, it's always going to live uh, within this so-called light cone. So uh, k is always going to be smaller than omega over c. But then the states I'm trying to access, these subradiant states, live outside of the light cone. So the, the, the wave vectors of the laser field and these subradiant states are fundamentally mismatched. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So even though this is kind of for an array, I think uh, at least qualitatively a similar story is true for, for just disordered ensembles as well. I think subradiants generally exist in, in, in any kind of atomic ensemble, but it's very hard to see experimentally just by some type of uh, this kind of impedance mismatch. Um, but you know, the special thing about arrays is that subradiants now acquires a very physical intuitive meaning. Um, it's really nothing more than the, this chain of atoms is acting like a, some kind of fancy waveguide or optical fiber. Um, so once you realize that, um, then you can try to cook up uh, efficient ways to couple to these guided modes. And one way to couple to guided modes is by using another set of guided modes. And just to make that more specific, here I'll consider an optical nanofiber. Um, so to, to obey the diffraction limit, um, a lot of the light actually kind of leaks evanescently out of the, the fiber core and into the surrounding vacuum region. So realistically, this kind of evanescent field into the vacuum can extend several hundreds of nanometers. Um, and that's useful for interfacing uh, uh, these guided modes to light. So for example, one thing you can do is you can shine in light that's very far off resonance. Um, this far off resonant light will simply act as a trap for atoms. Uh, you can uh, do even better and send light both ways, so that creates a kind of standing wave pattern and an optical lattice. So that allows you to trap atoms periodically uh, very close to the fiber. And then once atoms are trapped there, if you send in near resident light, the atoms will an interact very efficiently with that light, essentially because the guided modes are re still relatively tightly confined. You have a very small effective area. Um, so experimentally, uh, you know, even though you have an optical lattice, you still have to fill it. Um, experimentally at the moment, it, you, people tend to get around 50% filling of the lattice sites. So it's not a perfect lattice. Uh, you know, in, in, in the kind of theory, we want kind of 100%. But there's kind of efforts underway to, to try and improve uh, this 50% filling factor. Um, and you know, finally, just to quantify this notion of efficient coupling, um, one way to quantify that is imagine I have just one atom trapped near this nanofiber. I bring it up to the excited state, and I want to calculate the collection efficiency or the branching ratio. So when that excited atom emits a photon, with what probability does that photon emit into the guided modes of the nanofiber, uh, gamma 1d, uh, compared to the emission rate into free space in the 4 pi? And it turns out for kind of conventional nanofiber interfaces that uh, fraction is about 5 to 10 percent. Um, so that, that's just kind of you know, experimentally you know, fast forward a bit. Imagine you know, soon that you can kind of create uh, small ordered arrays you know, with, with no kind of empty sites um, of, of atoms uh, near a nanofiber. Um, so let me just kind of redraw the dispersion relations of the guided modes of the individual systems. So the blue curve here was the uh, single excitation block modes of just the atomic uh, chain alone. And again, the interesting states are these kind of subradiant states with a k vector beyond the light line. 
Um, now, a fiber mode, um, if it's guided by definition, it, uh, it's also going to have a dispersion relation that lives beyond the light line. So k is always going to be bigger than omega over c. And then kind of generically, you know, if you create such a system, uh, the fiber dispersion relation and the dispersion relation of these kind of atomic spin waves are going to intersect somewhere. Um, and and uh, once they intersect, uh, these fiber modes and uh, these kind of atomic chain modes can efficiently interact with each other. They're now impedance matched. Um, so if they're impedance matched and, and they can efficiently uh, interact, um, then I've kind of slightly changed uh, the, 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 the topic on you guys. So now this kind of atomic mode, which is efficiently coupled, will no longer be subradiant, right? Because if, if you have this atomic excitation and it sees modes to couple to, it'll simply emit a photon uh, into, into, into those guided modes. Um, so it'll no longer be subradiant. Um, for for you know, lack of any other term, uh, we, we call it selective radiance. But it turns out if your goal is to build an efficient atom light interface, that's perfect. That's exactly what you want. Um, what I mean by that is you know, if you imagine uh, creating one of these kind of atomic uh, uh, spin wave modes that, that's, impedi that's uh, impedance matched, um, uh, then you, this, this uh, mode will emit efficiently into the waveguide. Um, so you'll experience collective enhancement. So basically, this single collective excitation will no longer emit at a rate gamma 1d into the fiber, but at a rate n times gamma 1d, even though it's just one excitation, but shared among n atoms. So recall that this kind of collective enhancement is a key ingredient or key feature of just atomic ensembles in free space as well under the Maxwell block equations. So this kind of collective enhancement is nothing kind of new or, or special. What's special is that because you know, I have the spatial ordering and because this particular collective atomic mode has a k vector that's bigger than that of free space, I can at the same time is, uh, that I get collective enhancement into the good guided nanofiber modes, I can get a collective suppression of emission into the bad free space modes, which are hard to collect. Okay. Um, so interestingly, uh, one might expect that this kind of emission rate into free space will actually become suppressed as a function of atom number. Um, so you might remember yesterday, if I just had a chain of, of, of atoms in empty space, the most subradiant mode had a decay rate that decreased like one over number of atoms cubed. Okay. Um, so basically, if I think about the light as carrying quantum information, you know, this quantum information is good because I can collect it and, 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 and send it to other places. This quantum information that's just lost into free space is bad. And what dictates the kind of fidelity of applications one would expect would be the, ratio, the branching ratio of n times gamma 1d over gamma prime. So recall that if I uh, assume independent emission, like in the, in the um, Maxwell block equations, then you know, gamma prime is just uh, uh, independent of n. Um, it's just the single atom emission rate. So this ratio is, uh, becomes the optical depth of the medium. It's linear in the number of atoms. And then the point is by exploiting interference in such a geometry, this branching ratio can be much bigger than d. And in particular, it can grow super linearly, you know, maybe like n to the fourth power um, in, in, in the number of atoms. So we can use this kind of extremely favorable branching ratio to try and beat the usual error limits set by the optical depth um, in, in various applications. Um, so is, is that kind of key idea uh, clear to everyone? OK, so, um, so I'll, I'll shortly go and analyze one particular application. Um, but to say that we can do better than the old equations, we have to actually set up kind of a, a, an artificial model of an atom nanofiber interface that has the same assumptions as the Maxwell block equations. So in particular, I'll refer to this kind of hypothetical model as the independent emission model. So basically, we have a chain of atoms that are coupled to the fiber. We'll assume that they can uh, you know, emit efficiently into the guided modes by collective enhancement. But then just kind of by hand, I'm going to say that they emit into free space independently and at a fixed rate, gamma naught. Okay, so this is essentially the Maxwell block equations, but now adapted to the nanofiber system. And then I want to compare that to the collective emission, where I now uh, use my kind of spin model to account for interference in all directions, both into the waveguide and into free space. Um, so to do that, I, I again just go back to the spin model. Um, yesterday I talked about this kind of uh, quantum spin model just in, in free space. Okay? So it turns out it's pretty, pretty easy, at least in, in principle, to adapt to a nanofiber. 
Um, so the only thing that changes in the spin model is that instead of putting in the electromagnetic Green's function for free space, you should put it in the Green's function for a nanofiber system. Um, so physically, this uh, Green's function is nothing more than, you know, if I, so this Green's function says, if I put an oscillating point dipole at position, let's say, Rj, what's my total field, uh, radiated field, at another position, let's say, Ri? Um, but now accounting for the dielectric perturbation of the nanofiber in, in vacuum. And above all, you know, this Green's function for the nanofiber will include the possibility that this oscillating dipole at one point will launch guided modes into, uh, will, 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 will excite the guided modes of the nanofiber. And similarly, you know, I can just straightforwardly adapt this kind of input-output equation. I just have to replace the, the electromagnetic Green's function of free space with that of the fiber. Um, furthermore, if we take a cylindrical fiber, you can use um, basically the, the symmetry of the system and actually analytically solve for the Green's function um, in, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of Bessel functions. Um, so I said that when you, can, when, you, when you can solve for the Green's function, um, I think that means kind of in principle, okay? So it's really just an exercise in pages and pages <laughs> of, of Bessel functions. Um, so, you know, it's not something that you want to do, but if you're lucky, you can find a postdoc who, who will do it for you. Um, they might not be happy about it, and they might not want to talk to you later, but, uh, but they'll do it. Um, okay, so, um, so that's kind of formally how we adapt the green, uh, uh, this kind of spin uh, model to the nanofiber. Um, and now let me talk about a particular application. So I kind of alluded, it, alluded to it yesterday. Um, so I'm going to talk about a photon storage or a quantum memory for light. Um, just to remind you of, of the point of this application, um, you know, if I have uh, photons, um, that's a convenient way to, to, to transmit quantum information over long distances. So for example, I could imagine encoding a qubit in either the polarization degree of freedom of the photon or in some kind of timing, like it can arrive early or late. Um, so while it's good to, for, so while photons are good to transmit information, they're not really good to kind of store information. Right? Imagine that you know the information in your hard drive was flying around at the speed of light. Right? It'd be very hard to, to to kind of retrieve in any sensible form. Um, so uh, in, in quantum mechanics, we have the additional difficulty that if we have some kind of uh, qubit, we can't just go measure it, you know, and copy it, you know, in order to in order to store the information. Um, so what we can imagine doing instead is just sending that entire quantum wave function of the photon into, for example, an atomic ensemble. Um, this uh, photon might coherently excite the ensemble. So uh, now I'll have some atomic wave function where one atom is excited in some you know, certain superposition. Um, so now I've converted a flying photon into a kind of stationary uh, a qubit or stationary excitation. And ideally, this is a quantum coherent process, or there's really some kind of unitary map that describes uh, this dynamics. Um, so, you know, one, so the reason I kind of focus on this particular application is that it's really still in the single excitation limit. I'm really only, only interested in storing a single uh, photon. So we can just directly extend our previous calculations and, and, and concepts. Um, it's maybe a bit of a technical point, but I, I want to clear up some potential confusion. So I also mentioned yesterday that if we deal with this spin model in the single excitation regime, it's completely equivalent to classical linear optics. It's like the physics of classical coupled uh, radiating dipoles. So maybe it's kind of strange that you know, the, the physics is classical, but I'm calling it a quantum memory or quantum application. Um, so it turns out it's no paradox. I, I mean, that's just because the memory itself ideally is just passive. Right? I mean, the whole goal of the memory is you have a, a, a photon qubit, you give it to me to store, and at some later time, I just give it back to you. So I'm not manipulating the, the qubit in any way. In particular, I'm not creating any more entanglement if there was no entanglement to begin with. So in this case, the quantumness really just comes from the fact that this qubit itself could be quantum. It could be entangled with, with other degrees of freedom. Um, but that entanglement was created by external sources. Okay, so it's a quantum application, but you know, it's kind of classical in, in, in its um, uh, understanding. Okay, so um, this quantum memory should be kind of, it should work both ways. So I should be able to convert a photon to a stationary atomic excitation, but then at some later time, I should be able to reverse it and convert it back to a photon. Right? That's how a hard drive should work. Um, so it turns out by time reversal symmetry, um, the error, prob error probability um, 
By error, I just mean you know, when you try to, to store a photon or when you try to retrieve it, there's some probability they just lose the excitation altogether. Um, so that error probability is going to be the same in storage and retrieval. Um, and I say that just because it's easier in practice to, uh, to optimize the retrieval process. So in other words, if I start with some collective single excitation, I mean, it's easier to calculate what's the probability that I get a guided photon coming out. Um, the reason it's easier is because here I explicitly have kind of atomic degrees of freedom, atomic excitations, and my spin model is really in terms of atomic excitations in the first place. Um, also, just a bit of a technical note, uh, maybe for those who work with quantum memories or, or know of quantum memories. Um, so technically, this kind of uh, system, so here I kind of assume that the atoms are two-level. It is a quantum memory, but it's not a very practical one. What I mean by that is, you know, when you send in the photon, you know, it'll coherently excite or the atoms will coherently absorb uh, this photon. You'll generate, you know, atomic excited states. But then if your atoms are excited, they'll simply just kind of uh, spontaneously emit again. And the emission can be you know, uh, super radiant or, or subradiant, but the point is you have no control over the timing, right? That photon is just going to be spit out at some you know, fixed time uh, that, uh, that you can't control. Um, so to fix that, in practice, uh, when people build kind of quant practical quantum memories, they typically go to uh, some kind of EIT or three-level scheme. Um, basically, you still have the kind of two-level structure, uh, G to E, uh, which is coupled by the waveguide photons. And basically the idea is you introduce a third level. This can be a second ground state or some metastable state that lives for a very long time. And the idea is that you know, as the photon comes in and you start to excite uh, uh, population into the state E, you basically apply a, a second laser field, just a control field, to kind of siphon off the population from state E and, and, and kind of shelve it in this long-lived state. And you know, if that state kind of lives forever, um, then when you're eventually ready to, to kind of uh, retrieve that photon, you simply turn on uh, this field again, uh, bring population up to E, and leak it out in the, in, 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 in the form of a photon. So this is a practical quantum memory. Um, but it turns out if we just, in terms of kind of mathematical efficiency, the error is the same. So I can analyze uh, the error of this kind of you know, unpractical uh, uh, two-level quantum memory. And, and you know, I, I basically get all the, the physics that I want. So, so that's what I'm going to do here. OK, so um, let me just kind of qualitatively describe uh, how we can analyze the quantum memory. So the numerical procedure uh, goes something kind of like this. And I say numerical procedure because I just kind of want to emphasize that even though you're, you haven't worked with the spin model, most of you have not not worked with the spin model before, Maybe it looks a little abstract. You know, it's just kind of n-coupled uh, equations. So yeah, you know, mathematically, it's something that you can easily just plug into your computer. Okay, so what we do is we, we, we want to analyze the retrieval process. So we, we assume we have uh, a single excitation, but which is stored in a kind of superposition of different atoms. Okay. Um, then what we want to do is we just want to calculate the Schrodinger uh, equation time evolution of, of the state under this effective spin model Hamiltonian. Um, once you uh, have the state at all times, uh, you can calculate the probability that a photon was emitted into the waveguide. That's going to be basically the time integral of the power, um, the intensity of light uh, emitted into the guided modes, uh, integrated over all times. So that gives you kind of a total energy. And if you normalize that energy by the energy of one photon, h bar omega, then you finally have the probability of emission of a photon into the waveguide. Um, and then the next thing you can do is simply optimize over all the amplitudes Cj to get the maximum uh, retrieval probability or retrieval efficiency. Um, so in practice, you know, in, in, in concept, that's kind of you know, all there is to the calculation. In practice, you can actually kind of speed it up quite a bit. So instead of trying to really optimize over this massive dimensional, Hilbert, uh, massive dimensional parameter space, um, you can formally kind of play some mathematical tricks and, and turn it into an efficient optimization uh, 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 algorithm. Okay, so um, let me just kind of show you the results. Here's the retrieval or storage error um, in this kind of atom, in this array nanofiber interface as a function of atom number. Um, so the red curve here um, is actually just the independent emission model. So it's basically the kind of you know, Maxwell block equations. And you see the error, at least once you go to high atom number, 
scales kind of inversely like the number of atoms, like 5.8 divided by optical depth. Um, it turns out this kind of asymptotic scaling is exactly the same one that's derived for an atomic ensemble in free space under the Maxwell block equations. Um, alternative, you can really account for uh, wave interference into all directions. And then when you do that, you find this kind of new scaling where the kind of error scales like 1 over n squared. So really, we found a, a better error bounds than was fundamentally thought uh, uh, to be possible. Um, just by, by, again, exploiting the power of interference. Um, so that sounds kind of cool, uh, you know, that we kind of you know, beat you know, something that, uh, that people thought was quite fundamental. But at the same time, maybe we can be a little bit greedy and say, well, this 1 over n squared doesn't really seem that great. Right? It doesn't seem ideal. And, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, one of these factors of n will automatically come from collective enhancement, so just enhanced emission into the guided modes. That already occurs in, in even just the Maxwell block equations. So essentially, we're only getting an extra factor of n from the suppression of emission in the free space. And that doesn't seem so great because, you know, as I kind of showed you yesterday, if I just take a, an, a chain of atoms in, in free space by itself, the most subradiant mode, so I can suppress emission in the free space, actually by amount 1 over n cubed. So it seems like we're losing factors of n somewhere. And so, um, you know, uh, yesterday and today, I spent a lot of time just trying to introduce classical intuition. And now we can see how all that intuition can, can pay off. Okay? Um, so uh, basically, uh, what I, I guess the kind of key points that I try to argue is that, you know, if you have just a kind of uh, nanofiber waveguide by itself, in principle, that thing is perfect. Right? It'll guide light forever, uh, and you'll never lose a photon into empty space. Um, you know, similarly, if I have this kind of composite kind of fancy fiber where I have a periodic chain of atoms coupled to a, a real nanofiber, um, that thing also in principle can guide light perfectly. Right? You'll, you'll never lose a photon. So it's basically like I have a perfect uh, bare nanofiber. I have a kind of per perfect composite fiber. And, and, and so um, now you know, if, if people, I guess people who work in, in, in optics labs, I guess you'll know that you know, if you have two different kinds of fibers, you know, both of them are perfect on their own. They both perfectly guide light. But if you want to connect them, you know, if you just kind of put them uh, one against each other, you have a problem, right? Because generically, they have different kind of spatial modes. They'll have different dispersion relations. So basically, when light guided in one region tries to enter the new fiber, it sees an impedance mismatch. And you get a lot of loss just at the interface. So the interface scatters the light into free space. Um, so you might believe that this kind of interface scattering is really the origin of this kind of moderate uh, 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 gain uh, from this kind of subradiance. Um, so basically what you need is you need to buy a fiber. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, a numerically, uh, uh, it's a numerically observed scaling. Oh, um, yeah, so, um, so basically, uh, I, I, I evolved my atomic state under H-effective. So this describes, in principle, uh, the loss of, of atomic excitation due to uh, emission of photons, uh, either into the fiber or into free space, but it fully includes interference. Um, so basically, uh, the loss is basically the, the part of the emission that goes into free space as opposed to the fiber. So if I can calculate how much light goes into the fiber, that's like I can see it's 99%, then I can automatically include, say, that the loss was 1%. So the way I do that is um, I can, in principle, through this input-output equation, uh, calculate the light going anywhere. So I can just calculate you know, the fraction of light going into the nanofiber. And from there, I can extrapolate how much is lost. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, so so it's a the 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 system is it's an infinite nanofiber, with a period with a finite uh, atomic chain uh, coupled to it somewhere. So yeah, it's not a it's not a it has no kind of symmetries of an infinite system, right? It's really just a hard cut. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, so because my, my real simulation is, a, is kind of a realistic system, it has these hard edges. Those hard edges can give rise to, to, to scattering by themselves. <laughs> yeah, so um, that, that's actually kind of tricky. So basically the issue is, you know, for these simulations, you see I, I have up to 200 atoms. So in principle, I have 200 parameters that I should go and optimize. Um, we haven't tried to do that explicitly, but my guess is it doesn't work so well. I mean, you probably can find local minima, but maybe not the, the real minima. So it's a little bit, I mean, it, there's no way to kind of argue it's true intuitively, but mathematically, it turns out you can cast this whole optimization into uh, an eigenvalue problem of a Hermitian matrix. So I can formally encode the, the, the error probability into the, the eigenvalue of a Hermitian matrix. And so basically I just have to go in and diagonalize a Hermitian matrix, which is efficient. Okay. So, so that's not obvious at all, but, but it just happens to be true. Um, okay. So, um, so basically, I need to buy some kind of fiber connector. And you know, a, a fiber connector connecting to atoms is not something you buy from, from Thor Labs. Um, but we can just kind of create one uh, on our own. So our kind of fiber connector is not really going to be any kind of physical device. But you know, if we now just kind of go from a two-level system back to a three-level system, um, recall that I can use this. I have this kind of external pump field, where my goal is to kind of shelve population from this excited state into some long-lived state. Um, so basically, I can start playing with this spatial shape. Okay, so maybe I can make the intensity very big at the edges and smaller in the middle of the chain. Um, so to understand why that might be good, uh, this is a little bit technical, but if you're familiar with electromagnetically induced transparency, you know that the amplitude of the control field dictates the bandwidth of the transparency window. So as you make the control field bigger and bigger, it's effectively like your atom uh, uh, becomes more and more transparent to the light. It's almost like it doesn't exist. So essentially what we're doing is we're turning on the atomic response slowly. It's like this atom is physically there, but in terms of a response to light, it's effectively not there. And this atom you know, has a little bit of a response, this atom has more response, and so on. It's kind of like an adiabatic transition from an empty fiber to this composite fiber. Okay? So I smooth out this discontinuous interface. So now I repeat the calculation, and surprise, there's not even kind of a 1 over n to the 4. But I find an exponential suppression of error with atom number or with, with the optical depth. Okay. Um, so to just kind of summarize uh, the, the, uh, the results up to here uh, for this nanofiber, so okay, everything I did was kind of single excitation. So all the physics I can understand classically. Um, nonetheless, we still found an exponential gain for a genuine quantum application, uh, that of a, of a quantum memory. Um, so this is admittedly a very personal view, but it's kind of like, you know, once you smell kind of exponentials, you know, how do you ever go back to, to what you, you know, how do you just go back and accept what you learned in textbooks? It's like, you know, let's keep digging and, and find out what the real answer is in, in, a, in a broader context. So that's what really kind of drives my interest in this kind of, you know, multiple scattering and, and wave interference. I honestly don't believe that the limits that we know about today are anything close to, to what's real. Um, so the next thing I want to do is, you know, provide a kind of similar example where we can get a gain um, by exploiting interference, but I want it to be a genuine quantum application. So it's not going to be physics that we can completely understand in terms of classical physics alone. Any questions up to here? Yeah, I mean, so it's not easy. I mean, uh, I mean, so I, I think generally what it illustrates is the, the spin model. If you, I, I mean, if you know what parameters you're using, like I know the the control field and and lattice constant. It's just you, you should view it as some kind of numerical black box where you put in stuff, you get the right answer, but you don't necessarily understand why. Um, you notice that like a lot of the intuition I, I provided was kind of independent of the spin model. Right, it's just kind of intuition from classical optics and so on. So what you really have to do is just kind of put them together. You use the classical intuition as kind of as guidance to create hypotheses. You use the spin model to kind of uh, confirm confirm that, but it's hard to kind of see it directly from the spin model alone. 
Um, if you want a little bit more of a specific uh, answer, um, well, a, a similar calculation you can do is just if you have this kind of uh, empty, um, uh, if you just have a chain of atoms just in free space, and you make it three level to, to provide a similar analogy, and then you, you were to apply in this spin model a, a control field which varies spatially, um, you would find a similar effect. So if you look for subradiant modes, you would find subradiant modes whose decay rate is now exponentially small in the atom number. Um, so it does show up in the spin model if you kind of play with it correctly. But I guess the point is, without the classical intuition, you would never think that this kind of you know, spatial shaping of, of control fields would be good for anything. Does that make sense? Um, I don't. The, the, I think the details don't really matter. So you know, I think here we just chose rather some generic uh, shape. I think if you start optimizing this shape, you could. I mean, I think you would still have exponential, but you could probably make an even steeper curve than what you see here. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So I think this kind of exponential is is robust uh, to the specific shape as long as it's smooth and as long as it's big at the edges. Um, Okay, um, so I said, you know, next let's try to work towards a, toward a genuine quantum application. And I put in the word toward because uh, before I can jump directly to the quantum application, I have to introduce a little bit of, uh, a little bit more uh, classical physics. Um, so it's an example that I also kind of uh, briefly alluded to yesterday, which that if I create a kind of 2D array of atoms, let's say infinite, uh, just for simplicity, um, that in principle can form a perfect mirror for single resonant photons. Um, so, so let me try to explain how that works. And later we're going to you know, exploit this kind of reflection to really do something truly quantum mechanical. Um, so uh, the, it, the intuition goes something like this. Um, just for simplicity, uh, so now I've kind of rotated the geometry. The, the, array of, uh, the atom array lives in the xy plane. And then just for simplicity, the light that I send in at the beginning is going to be on normal incidence, so in the, in the z direction. Um, so in general, my, my, um, my light is described by a three-dimensional wave vector, which describes the direction of propagation. And at normal incidence, uh, the in-plane component of the wave vector is going to be zero. Okay, so that just says it's you know, perpendicular uh, to the plane. Um, so because of the discrete translational symmetry of, of the system, I know that exactly the form of the collective uh, spin wave excitation um, that this plane wave is going to excite. In particular, I'm going to, if the plane wave is weak, so at most there's only one excitation in the system, then I'm going to couple to this kind of collective excitation where one atom is excited with a relative phase e to the i k r, where this wave vector k parallel is exactly that of the, of the light that I send in. So in particular, if I come in a normal instance, um, all the atoms will be excited in the same relative phase. That kind of makes sense. Okay, so um, now that I know the, the, the form of the atomic excitation, the form of the spin wave that's generated, I think I can think about how that spin wave re-radiates light. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I can kind of take a plane wave decomposition of the light that's re-radiated. And kind of intuitively, um, one would expect that this spin wave should be able to re-radiate light with uh, a kind of in-plane ve vector, k parallel, that's exactly that of the spin wave. So if we ignore this kind of vector g for a moment, that's that g equals zero, it kind of makes sense that this spin wave can excite an electric field, a, a plane wave, uh, with a kind of in-plane component e to the i k r. Um, but then, of course, my electric field lives in, in three dimensions. So this is really just the kind of uh, parallel component of the wave vector. I can have a perpendicular component of, of the wave vector as well, which describes how the field evolves as you go away from, from the atomic plane. Um, so, so that's kind of intuitive that you know, a spin wave of wave vector k can generate an electric field of wave vector k. But um, because my, my system has a discrete translational invariance, it's possible that my lattice can add discrete momentum components to the electric field as well. Um, so it's a little bit like a kind of a Bragg grading, if you want. Um, so in particular, uh, in, in addition to the original wave vector k, 
um, I can generate, uh, my lattice can generate uh, additional wave vectors, g, where g is basically any kind of reciprocal lattice vector. So my, my, my lattice in, in general can, can form a discrete superposition of different plane waves going in different directions. Um, so, so maybe that kind of description is a little bit mathematically abstract, but it kind of in pictures it looks like this. If I excite the k parallel equals zero spin wave, then you know, kind of intuitively this spin wave as it radiates can radiate either straight up or straight down, but it can also you know, kind of act as a, as a uh, Bragg, uh, Bragg grading, diffraction grading, and radiate light into discrete directions. So for example, here you have the first diffraction order where g is plus or minus two pi over d, and, and so on. Um, so Maxwell's equations dictate that, you know, the, the, some constraints on, on the total k vector. So in particular, k parallel plus g squared plus the k perpendicular squared has to equal omega over c squared. Um, so now if we go back to kind of normal instance if k parallel equals zero, um, if I specify that my lattice constant is smaller than the optical wavelength, <coughs> then um, any value of the reciprocal lattice vector I choose um, I'll have that g is bigger than omega over c, or you know, any multiple of 2 pi over d is going to be bigger than omega over c, unless g equals 0. Um, so if g itself is bigger than omega over c, that would force k perpendicular to be imaginary. Um, what that means is that, kind of, for example, this kind of first diffraction order that I illustrated here would not be a true radiation field, but it would be evanescent. So it can't actually radiate energy away. Um, so to kind of just summarize, if I have a sub-wavelength lattice constant, the field radiated by, by this atomic spin wave, by this k parallel equals zero spin wave, um, can only be normal to the lattice, and clearly it's going to be symmetric. So it'll radiate an equal amount up and an equal amount downward. Okay, so, so now let's finally understand how I can, uh, this system can create 100% reflection. Um, so imagine that you know, I have an array, and here I kind of rotated the plane a little bit, so the, the plane of the array comes into and out of uh, the board, so I'm just kind of showing a cross-section. I shine in light from one direction at normal instance. So formally, this kind of uh, configuration here is equal to the coherent sum of two different co configurations. So, um, so it's, uh, one possibility is you know, instead of sending in light from one direction, I send in light from both directions, um, and the relative phases of these fields are equal. What that means is that in the plane of the atomic uh, 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 array, uh, they constructively interfere and form an anti-node of a standing wave. Okay? Um, plus, uh, I can send in light from both directions, but I can put a minus sign on, on this field here. That means that at, in the atomic plane, these uh, instant fields uh, comp completely destructively interfere and form a node, so the atoms effectively don't see the light at all or vice versa, the light doesn't see the atoms. And notice that you know, if I add these kind of two configurations up, I finally get you know, a field coming in from this direction, and the fields uh, coming up from this direction cancel out. Okay, so how does that help? Well, let's consider how light scatters from this configuration first. Um, I argued that the light basically doesn't see the atoms at all because the atoms sit in a node. And therefore, each, uh, each of these individual plane waves will just kind of continue unimpeded past the atomic plane, um, they'll have a transmission coefficient of one. Um, this case is a little bit more subtle. So now uh, my atoms are excited because they sit in an anti-node of this kind of standing wave. But you know, recall what I said previously. Because this is an infinite system, because it's sub-wavelength, when these atoms are excited, they cannot radiate into random directions or even into other diffraction orders. They can really radiate, re-radiate both into the up or down directions. And, and, formally, uh, and furthermore, I can't, you know, because I have no energy radiated into other directions, I have to get out all the energy that I put in. So the amplitude of the transmission coefficient has to be one. Um, but then because if I specify that I'm sending in light on resonance, what happens is a kind of subtle effect. Um, I send in light on resonance. My, because the atoms are in resonance, uh, the atomic dipole moments, you know, the induced dipole, uh, that's kind of becomes 90 degrees out of phase with, uh, with the field. And then the field that this atomic dipole radiates is another 90 degrees out of phase. So basically the, the field that's re-radiated by the atoms is going to be out of phase with the light that comes in. 
but I have to get all the light out, and therefore the transmission coefficient has to be minus one. Um, so uh, uh, now I can kind of add up the, these two answers. Um, so in particular, let's consider you know, what's the light coming out from the bottom side. Um, so the light coming out from the bottom is you know, this field here, which is transmitted uh, with a, a phase of plus one, plus this field here, which is transmitted with a phase of minus one. So you see they cancel out. I have exactly zero transmission on resonance. And then I can play the same game to find out what's reflected. And I see the reflection coefficient should be uh, 100%. Um, so what's interesting is that, so uh, I've tried to argue kind of on intuitive grounds that on resonance, uh, an array of atoms will be perfectly reflecting. Um, what's interesting is that up to now, I've never explicitly invoked the spin model, right? It's just kind of, you know, intuition and, and, and kind of, you know, you know mathematical tricks. Um, so it turns out you can formally derive it from the spin model and, and combine with the input-output equation, but it's actually much more work. Um, so again, that kind of illustrates that you know, if you, once you just realize there's interference in the problem, you can gain a lot of intuition without actually having to, to go through all this kind of spin model uh, business. Okay, so um, basically what I've established so far is that you know, I can have 100% reflectance of single photons at normal instance once my lattice constant is smaller than lambda. Um, so in principle, you can kind of repeat the same uh, arguments um, if you start to shrink the lattice constant even further, then what you find is that there's a kind of increasing range of angles of light that you can send in around normal incidents, um, where you, again, can't scatter into diffraction orders because they're all evanescent. So basically, then you can achieve 100% reflection for this increased range of incident angles as well. Um, finally, once you reach a lattice constant of lambda over 2, you can get 100% reflection no matter what direction you send in the light from. Um, there's actually just one important catch, though, which is that this light has to come in on resonance. And when I say on resonance, it's not the bare resonance frequency of an individual atom, but it's actually the dressed resonance frequency of this collective spin wave that you're exciting. And this dressed resonance frequency will, in general, be different than the bare resonance frequency, essentially because you know, a, a given atom sees the light coming from all the other atoms, and that int introduces some kind of interaction energy. Okay. Um, so what that means in practice is that you know, if you come in, instead of, with, instead of coming in with a plane wave, if you come in with a focused light beam, that focused light beam is composed of a, of a superposition of different k vectors. And that means that you know, because, you can't, because this kind of uh, resonance frequency depends on k itself, you can't simultaneously achieve you know, resonance for all the different k vectors. So you'll see slightly less than 100% reflection, even if you have a perfect Lattice. Um, so it turns out that you know, uh, as of a few months ago, um, this is no longer just kind of pure theoretical uh, fantasy, but this is something that can be experimentally observed, particularly in, in the in the block Emanuel blocks group in, in MPQ. Um, so let me just kind of you know, highlight some of the main experimental results and, and the setup. So basically, um, what they do is they create a, a nearly defect-free a 2D array of atoms with sub-wavelength spacing. Um, they do that through a actually kind of complicated uh, setup uh, that's basically a kind of quantum degenerate gas of, of ultra-cold atoms. I mean, it was something what's called a quantum gas microscope. Um, and basically, the, the main trick to creating this kind of defect-free array is that they go through, they, because of atomic interactions, they can kind of go through an, a, a, a quantum phase transition and create something what's known as a Mott insulating state. Um, the, the, the specific properties are, of, of this mod insulating state aren't so important, but the main uh, thing to take away is that this mod insulating state, this phase, um, is basically guaranteed to have exactly one atom per site. Okay, so you have no defects. Um, so once you create that kind of defect-free array, you can send in a light, um, you know, uh, it, uh, to 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 reach the atomic array. Something will bounce off. You collect that light and you kind of image it on a CCD. And when you do that, you get something like, like this. So you see that basically exactly where you have atoms, you see this kind of you know, spike in, in, in reflection. Um, and where you have no atoms, you see no reflected light. 
Um, if you want to be a little bit more quantitative, uh, you can you know change the the resonance frequency, or you can change the frequency of the light you you send in, and actually map out a reflection spectrum. Um, you see that basically on resonance, you get a, re a reflectance in this case of of sixty percent. Um, so it's 60% uh, rather than 100% because of various um, uh, 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 technical imperfections. Um, but maybe the most important one is that um, in this particular experiment, it's not really feasible to kind of just send in one photon um, and then kind of reset the experiment, you know, build a, another mod insulating state, send in another photon, and so on. That just takes too long. So, so what they do in practice is they send in actually, it's a, they send in weak light. So at, at any one time, you probably only have one excited atom in your system. But they send in that light over a very long time. So the, the integrated total number of photons is huge. Um, so that means that any one photon is likely to have scattered many, uh, sorry, any one atom is likely to have scattered many photons. And for those of, of, of you who are a little bit familiar with, with, um, with atom trapping and, and cooling, you know that any, so an atom is pretty light. And any time you scatter a photon, the atom can get a little bit of a momentum kick into a random direction. And once you scatter enough photons, that momentum kick really starts to accumulate. The atoms pick up a significant kinetic energy. And so you can really think of it as basically these atoms start to really move around dynamically. And so it looks kind of a little bit like a disordered lattice rather than a perfect ordered lattice. So it's not the only effect, but it's probably you know, a predominant effect why, why you see 60% reflectance instead of closer to 100%. So, so the theory is really only due to, I mean, the theory really only accounts for kind of really perfect ordering, so that all the interference from all the different dipoles is perfect. So, you know, once you start to, to displace the, the atoms, <coughs> I mean, you might think it's a little bit like kind of, you know, if you displace the atoms enough, it's a little bit like kind of what Remy showed, right? You might expect to see kind of speckle coming out. But it's a, it's a kind of continuous transition from perfect to, to, this, to this speckle. Um, so, so, um, if you, so I think realistically you would not get 100%, or let, let me kind of step you through the, 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 the other imperfections. So the first issue is really just kind of technical. You know, you send in many photons, the atoms start to heat up and, and move around. Um, but imagine you can kind of fix that and really just send in kind of one photon. Um, the next issue that's kind of left over is, you know, even if, um, so the atoms sit in, in a, in a, in a, external potential, a trapping potential, but the atoms are still relatively light. So even if they're in the ground state of that trap, there's still a quantum zero point motion that's left over. So it's not huge, but it's you know, some non-negligible fraction of, of, the, um, of, of the lattice constant or of the, the free space wavelength of light. Um, so how that quantum zero point motion enters exactly into the scattering properties, that's actually still a little bit of an open question. So you know, to lowest order, you might maybe kind of one toy models, you can say, well, maybe in terms of light scattering, it's maybe like just kind of classical position disorder. Um, so, you know, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Um, but you, you, the, the quantitative effect of, of quantum motion has not really been kind of elucidated yet. Um, beyond that, there's still another issue. Um, so um, just, so this experiment wasn't really constructed with, you know, the, the idea of, of uh, creating, of observing this kind of quantum optics. So basically, in this particular configuration, um, you have an atomic ground state and an atomic excited state. Um, only the ground state is trapped. Okay? So you know, once you go up to the excited state, the atom kind of goes crazy um, in terms of, of the motion. And that probably has some effect on how, much, how close you can get to 100% as well. But again, even that isn't, uh, hasn't been quantified carefully in theory either. Yeah, so, so there's a number of reasons why you, you would not expect to get truly to 100%. But you know it hasn't been completely uh, the, the details aren't completely understood. In terms of uh, distance compared to the wavelength, how is it uh, smaller than sorry, probably smaller than lambda? Yeah. I, yeah. So I lambda over speed. no, I believe it's le uh, 0 0.6 lambda. Uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, something like that.
Any more questions? No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a small fraction of the natural line width, but I'm sorry, I, I don't know that number off, off hands. Um, okay, so maybe now is a good time to conclude, but maybe, let, me just, let, me just, let me just give a brief preview for, for next time. Um, so again, like the mirror uh, is just a classical linear optical effect, um, but then, you know, here I, I've kind of artificially restricted myself. I say I send it in very weak light, so at most there's one excitation. But it's not like you know, photons are a limited resource in the lab. Right? I can easily just crank up the laser intensity. So what happens if I do that? Um, may I, would I expect to see some kind of optical nonlinearities? You know, that's not completely unreasonable because in, you know, these are not classical particles, but they're two-level systems. So each two-level system can fundamentally only scatter one photon at a time. And you know, if we're lucky, maybe these, these nonlinearities are even strong at the level of single photons. So maybe one sending in one photon versus two photons can have significantly different effects. Um, if that's true, then I can maybe imagine using this array. You know, I can send in two photons, I can entangle them, start to build quantum gates for photons, and so on. Um, so that's where I'm going to end today and what I'll pick up uh, tomorrow. Oh, um, yeah, I know. What you, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. I, I actually don't recall the, the details of, of what they do. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I don't recall the, the, de the experimental details. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so actually, th this spectrum here is the product of, of many, many repeated runs. Um, Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. Um, so, so, in, so we have a paper about the topic. In that paper, I think we have a really nice figure. Unfortunately, I didn't really include it here. But let me see if I can try and uh, so uh, you have to kind of be imaginative. <laughs> But um, basically, the idea is um, I can avoid. So basically, recall that free space modes, by definition, have a k vector that's smaller than omega over c. So my goal is to ensure that in the dynamics at all times, I avoid creating such wave vectors. The issue is that anytime, so imagine I have some kind of k vector, so some guided mode that's propagating through the system. If I see any type of discontinuous interface, that interface adds all kind of of momentum components, right? So basically what I want to do is kind of smooth out that, that discontinuity. Um, so if you actually uh, monitor the, the, the spin wave itself in time, like, you know, in the, in the simulations, if you actually kind of take, make a movie of this, what you find is that you know, if I were to just kind of terminate, if I were to make this control field spatially uniform, um, you know, the, 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 the spin wave would kind of propagate uh, smoothly but then here, it just kind of sees a kink. So you know, it develops a, a kind of kink in the, in the shape. 
And that kink has way vector components and it now scattered into free space. So basically when I play with this kind of control field shape, uh, now when you run the movie, what you see is that you know, this kind of um, spin wave smoothly propagates, but then as you hit the edge, it kind of smoothly deforms. So you, you avoid any kind of sharp features in the spin wave itself at any moment in time. So, so that's the kind of intuition behind the, this kind of uh, exponential gain. So, sorry, there are actually like a lot of great questions today. I don't, <laughs> I don't really know. Like, uh, it's hard to say which one is is. is I mean. We have one more lecture. If you decide. Well, I mean, but there's actually so many good ones today. So I feel like I should, you know, give this out today and maybe give out another one tomorrow. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, well, yeah. Again, like they were all really interesting questions, but um, maybe one interesting one uh, in particular was, uh, you know, if you just look at the spin model, how do you tell it? There's some kind of exponential. Gain in, in the first place um, instead of n to the four. I, I forgot who asked that. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs>